Hi, this is Yarrow, and thank you for joining me on today's podcast, where I'm very excited to talk to Dr. John Martini. Hello, John. Thanks for joining me today. Thank you for having me. So, John, like a lot of people, um, I was actually first introduced to your, your face and your name from the very popular Secret uh, uh, documentary series that came out a number of years ago. And uh, you and all the other speakers on that show introduced me to you know, the law of attraction as a topic and, and, uh, and the secret as it was called back then. Um, but you're also known for a lot more than just the law of attraction uh, you know, as a speaker, an author, a coach, a behavioral scientist, I believe. Um, but today, we're gonna talk a little bit more than just personal development. We wanna sort of address the topic that's hot as we record this, which is, uh, business in the in the time of a coronavirus since you know you're at home or I'm assuming you're at home I'm at home uh, we're all working from home if we can so we'd like to sort of address that for entrepreneurs for business owners to sort of talk about how you can uh, do, do what you can to survive and, and even thrive possibly in this environment um, before we do that John I personally am very curious to know about your own business background um, I've you know done a little bit of digging I know you grew up in Houston Texas there was um, some dyslexia growing up, but can you maybe take me back to that time and you know what your youth was like? And in particular, did you see yourself ever becoming any kind of entrepreneur back then? And were there any influences, uh, entrepreneurs in the family or people you respected and admired uh, back then when you were, you were young? <laughs> okay. Um, when I was born, I was born uh, with my arm and leg turned in. So I had a deformity of the arm and leg. And when I was a year and a half, I also found out I had a speech impediment. I couldn't use my mouth properly. So I had to wear braces on my arm and leg from age one and a half to four. And I had to go to speech pathologist for that same duration. <clears throat> and used to use strings and buttons in my mouth, all these exercises to try to get my mouth to properly work. Wow. When I was in um, elementary school, first grade, I started normal reading. I went to remedial reading. I end up in a dunce cap. Okay. Because I couldn't read. I couldn't read. Very nice. Words. Okay. And I was told by my first grade teacher in front of my parents that I'm afraid your son is never going to be able to read. He'll never be able to write because I wrote backwards. And um, he's not going to be able to communicate. He's not going to mount anything. He's never going to go very far in life. So I would recommend they put him into sports because ever since I got out of my braces at four, I just wanted to run. So there's a very Forrest, Forrest Gump sort of story here. Forrest Gump kind of thing. Yeah. I made it through elementary school with the help of the smartest kids, asking them questions, befriending them. And I made it through school until 12, just getting through by asking questions to smart kids. My parents moved from Richmond, Te Houston, Texas to Richmond, Texas at 12. <clears throat> Low socioeconomic area, a lot of uh, racial issues, no smart kids. I ended up failing. I dropped out of school and was a street kid as a teenager. So I left home at 13 and then I was uh, a street kid till about 18. Well, street kid and beach kid. Okay. I ended up hitchhiking to California when I was 14 and then lived on the beaches there and then eventually on the streets there. And then I lived also, I, I made my way over to Hawaii to ride big waves because I was just into surfing. Wow. <clears throat> I, uh, at age 17, almost 18, I was surfing big waves over there in the North shore of Oahu. And I nearly died. And I, in a recovery process, I was led to a little health food store because I was unconscious for three and a half days. And I led to health food store after I came conscious. And then to a yoga class. And this yoga class, I met this teacher who inspired me to do what I'm doing today. Mm. Okay. So from age 17, the week before my 18th birthday till now, which is 47, almost 48 years, 47 and a half years, I've been on a mission to learn how to read, learn how to write, learn how to speak, overcome those, those challenges, and try to excel in those areas and become a teacher and travel the world and go to every country. I've been to 154 countries now. So that has been my dream since then. I didn't think of it as an entrepreneurial. I just wanted to overcome my learning problems and become intelligent. I never thought I'd ever be intelligent until then. Now, my dad realized I had problems in, in learning. And he wanted me to be street smart, at least. 
And so when I was nine, I started my first company. Okay. So, because I went to my dad and I said, dad, I want to buy a baseball and a glove and a bat. How do I do it? And he said, well, did you mow the yard? Yes. Did you edge the sidewalk? Yes. Did you sweep the garage out and clean the garage? Yes. Did you weed the flower bed? Yes. Did you plant, do all the hedges? Yes. Did you wash and your, your, your clothes? Yes. Did you shine my shoes? Yes. He said, son, I don't have anything needs to be done. If you want to earn money to buy what you want, you're going to have to go to the neighbors. So at age nine, I went door to door and I came across, across the Evans house and I saw an unruly yard and I started to offer that I would mow it, edge it, trim it, clean it, weed it, da, da, da. And there wasn't a lack of business opportunity. My dad was trying to teach me that if you want to make money, there's no lack of money. You just got to go out and serve people. So I went door to door. I closed deals. I collected some money and I bought my baseball glove and bat. I went to my dad with these things. And he said, where did you get the bat and the glove and the baseball? How'd you get that? And I said, well, I did what you told me. I went to the neighbors and I started working. He said, what did you do with the neighbors? I mowed and I edged and I swept. He said, what equipment did you use? And I said, well, the stuff in the garage. He said, son, I have to charge you for that. <laughs> so when I was uh, nine, my dad charged me. He said, you now owe me 750 for the use of those equipment. And I'd already spent my money. So now I had to go and do two more yards, three more yards to get ahead and to pay him his percentage and to pay for gas. So I started to work harder and make less. And then I noticed a kid came by and saw me pushing a lawnmower. They didn't have automated lawnmowers in 1963. And, he, and he, I thought, you know, I could get this kid to push this thing. I bet he'd do it. And I offered him 50 cents to do the pushing of a lawnmower. And uh, I ended up with three kids and then three and then another three. And I started borrowing the Zubrods and the Malice equipment. They talked to my dad and charged me the same amount. <laughs> and I uh, ended up going around closing deals around the neighborhood. And I got the kids to do the work and I supervised and I trained them. And after everything was paid, the gas equipment and everything else, I ended up with a net of $45. Now, $45 today with inflation from 1963 is around four, five, 500 bucks. You're so rich. I was doing pretty good as a nine-year-old. <laughs> yeah. If your kid went out and made 500 bucks a day, you'd probably be pleased. Yeah. So I went to my dad and, I, and he saw me do this and he saw me buying sport equipment and a bicycle and spending all my money. And he said, son, you got to learn to save a portion of your money. And he bought me a coin collection set and a piggy bank. And I started putting the coins in the coin collection set and in the piggy bank. In my office in Houston, Texas, on the 52nd floor of a Williams Tower, is the original piggy bank that my dad gave me in 1963 that has the original coins that have never been taken out of that piggy bank as a reminder to think long term. Mm. So, so my saying. dad is the one that was trying to help me become an entrepreneur. I saved my money. And then my dad said, well, now that you learned to save, now you learned how to earn, you got one more thing. You got to learn responsibility. So from now on, here's the deal. You're going to pay me from clothing, food, and rent, $750 a week, $30 a month, a dollar a day, basically. And, um, but that gives you the freedom to now go on that bicycle anywhere you want to go as long as you're home by 9 o'clock. All you have is the responsibility of being home at 9 o'clock every night. So my dad was trying to train me on how to be street smart and the accountabilities of real money management when I was young, because he saw that I couldn't read. Did this translate into that time in California and Hawaii? Like, did you take that forward into those years? I was also, well, in those times, it was the 60s. Okay. It's a free love days. <laughs> yep. And uh, so I, I found out it was, I, it made more money with more fun and made more economics to panhandle <laughs> and to, to meet girls on the beach and panhandle quarters. Okay. I got more fringe benefits okay. than working and sweating and having to find a place to shower all the time. Uh -huh. So I, I learned how to survive on the streets and do quite okay. I mean, I had some rough times. I've been shot at and I've been stabbed and I've had a few things along the way, but but in the process of doing it, I learned how to ask for what I want. 
All of those are perfect entrepreneurial training processes. Mm. And I also learned that nothing's missing. Things um, always emerge. There's never a lack of anything, of an opportunity for somebody if they care. And I learned that if you really, 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 really try to meet somebody's need, there was always a source of income. Mm. So, I, so I, I learned a lot from that. I, I can see that upbringing would have, especially your father, that's a huge influence. Uh, when you take that into this sort of next phase of your life from 17 onwards, where you sounds like you just dove into education. I know reading about you, you've, you've read a tremendous amount of books. Um, obviously, initially it was to overcome your own learning and the speaking and writing disabilities. But given you had that street smarts or even entrepreneurial smarts, as your father taught you, when you took that into this next phase of your life, 18, 19, 20, 21, was there a thought in your mind I'm going to be a speaker or a published author, or I'm going to start X kind of business. Like, what were you thinking? What was your goal? I, I, I'm, I'm in a hotel. I'm not at a home. I, I live okay. on a ship. My ship I've, is, I've heard that. Yeah. I, I, no one's allowed on the ship right yet until May 1st. So. Okay. So I'm in a hotel. But um, when I was 17 and I met this gentleman named Paul Bragg that inspired me the one night to do what I'm doing. I knew at that time that I wanted to travel the world and teach. That was clear. It was a lucid vision. It's painted in my office right now. If you come in my office, you'll see the painting of me speaking in front of a million people. Wow. It's standing from a balcony speaking to a million people with every major icon building in the background, in the background hmm. from every country, every city. So that's been a dream. That's been clear. But I also wanted to study healing and philosophy. And uh, so I learned how to read with the help of a dictionary and my mom testing me on 30 words a day to learn how to read. And I had to read 30 words a day and memorize them and put them in a sentence and use them and meaning and everything else in order for me to be able to eventually go past school. Cause I had to take a GED. I never finished high school. I take a GED mm -hmm. high school equivalency test. But once I learned that I could read and once I could practice using my mouth properly to speak, I didn't want to stop. It was the most inspiring thing in my life. And so when I turned 18, the, a 375 pound Afro-American woman asked me to come and teach her yoga. Then a man saw me meditating out in, a, in the sun. He said, can you teach me meditation? A Persian man. Then a gentleman asked me to do him, tutor, tutor him on mathematics that I was learning. And then a whole class of 16, 17 people came and gathered around me in a library and asked me to tutor them. And eventually I started charging for that. It was only 250 uh, for an hour when I started. When I went on to the University of Houston, I would get an average 100 to 150 people a day gathered under the trees and I started teaching. Sometimes it would swell to 400 people. And then people started wanting more tutoring. When I went on to professional school, uh, I started doing classes every single night and sometime during the day. And I taught some of the, the classes I was actually supposed to be taking in professional school. And I started charging for that. And my entrepreneur, I, I was at 23, I was making over $100,000 a year teaching. I got to ask you though, John, before I keep going, that's very young for everyone to see you as the teacher for, like you said, subjects that you yourself were just studying, what was it that pulled people to you? What was at such a young age? Like I understand, you know, now everyone expects the teacher to be an older, wiser person, but at 21, 22, 23, to pull these large crowds in quite diverse subjects too, was it just your magnetism? What was going on there? I, I think I really wanted to learn. And because of my thirst for knowledge and my thirst for expression, and I wanted to practice that because I knew I wanted to make that my life. Um, people could sense that. And people saw that I was doing the highest grades in school by then. And people were going, this guy's, he's really committed mm -hmm. to learning. And I, I read 18 to 20 hours a day. Mm. And I was, you know, I've read over 30,000, nearly 400 books now. And uh, so I delivered information. 
that they were intrigued by. I started doing test re reviews, um, content. I had a class every night. People didn't care what the topic was. They mm. just came. And I started charging $20 for night and students paid 20 bucks every night. Wow. And filled up my apartment. It was a single little apartment, but it was packed. And this is the and 70s. Pardon me? This is the 70s, I'm, I'm guessing. This is late okay. 70s, yeah. Okay. And then um, when I went out of school and I graduated, I started, I continued the process. I started doing classes every night in my clinic. And then, um, and that grew where I had, uh, <laughs> at one time I literally got me a 3,000 square foot lecture hall and I put uh, these big beacon lights on and I put megaphones out into parking lots and I started doing this and then I had my own TV show. I got channel 20 to, to download it into television and I did radio shows on a regular basis and I started, it just started spreading. And then I started to get more and more opportunities to speak on conferences and it just spread. Now it's been 154 countries speaking. Wow. So I just never gave up on the dream. You know, I know that many people have controversies about Donald Trump. I've known him almost 30 years. I used to live underneath him. I knew his family very well. And Donald taught me something. He says, if you want to build momentum, you got to be doing something consistently where people can see you're committed to it and you'll build a brand around what it is that you do. You can't flitter around and scatter yourself. You need to get what it is you do. Mm. I'm, I'm teaching. I'm, I'm researching, writing and traveling and teaching. I'm a writer and a teacher. And I use every possible vehicle to get information out. And that may be podcasts or webinars or live books. I, did a, I worked with a book publisher today. Um, movies, 42 movies now. I don't care what the vehicle, we're going to use every possible vehicle that's known to get information out to as many people. We've reached 5 billion people now, over 5 billion people. So it's just a matter of just building momentum and never stopping. It's perseverance that wakens accomplishment. Never, if you're clear about what you want to do and you have, there is no option. There's no turning back. You end up building momentum towards that objective. And here you are still, still doing it. So, um, I'd love to look at your business teaching part of this. So I, I can see how the momentum grew and, and you went from smaller groups to larger groups. And then of course, to larger audiences through media and so on. At what point did you, I guess, turn toward the corporate world as a, a speaker? Cause I know even like later on in this podcast, I'd love to talk a little bit about your advice for businesses in the yeah. coronavirus type world. But when did you start teaching that environment? And how did you find the transition from say meditation, um, you know, whatever else metaphysics you might've been studying yoga. And then now I'm going to teach profits. And like, obviously you had your father's input on some level, but there's a big difference between, well, not that big a difference, but there's a, a, a conceptual difference between what your father was teaching you and what you were doing versus a fortune 500 company and coming to speak in front of that audience. So could you talk yes. about that transition? Yes, I'd love to. Um, in 1982, I opened up a practice at a clinical practice. And I was doing a little of everything and I had one assistant. And I just, I went to a Walden's bookstore, which was a franchise at the time. And I came across a book by Alec McKenzie called The Time Trap. When I read that book, it really resonated with me and it really spoke to me because it was a lot of my weaknesses and ineptness was there. Such as what? I just didn't know how to run a business. So I figured I'm, I'm overwhelmed with things to do. I was enthused about working, but I was working unwisely. So I read this book and I summarized it. And so if I could, I'd like to share what allowed me to go from an, an office with one person to 18 months later, have five doctors and 12 staff members and tenfold increase in income. Sure. And just to clarify, a doctor, was that the chiropractic? I was a yet? chiropractor in practice. At okay. time. So my doctor, I did almost 10 years of college for the doctorate and then I practiced. Now, what's interesting is when I read that book and summarized it, whoever's listening, if they could take a piece of paper out and, and write down what I'm about to say, I'm absolutely certain, because I've shared it from leaders in governments, to corporations, to small practices, to you name it. So what I'm about to, to share, I, I promise you, is worth writing. You take a piece of paper and divide it into five columns, or six columns, five lines, equal spaced. In the first 
column on the left, you write down every single thing that you do in a day. Every single thing you do in a day currently in your business. Nothing's too big. Don't put broad, vague generalities like accounting or sales. The specific actions, the actual movements of your body that you do on a daily basis, itemize them all down. On the actions you do per day, not project per week or month, but today. Make a list of every action you do and make an exhaustive list. And some of it may be personal at home, some of it may be professional at work. Divide those out. Right next to it in the second column, write down, what does it produce per hour? What does it actually generate? Because if you're doing something that serves another human being and it meets their needs, they'll pay you for it. And that's a measure of the value that you're offering people and the productivity per hour. How much does it produce per hour? So you write down what it is and extrapolate it. So if you spend 10 minutes on it, you multiply it times six. If you spend two hours on it, divide it by, by two. But you extrapolate it to the best of your ability. What does it actually provide and pr improve, produce? Well, as I went down through my, my clinical practice in there, there were some things I was doing, exams, $125, 10 minutes, multiplied times six, okay, 750 per hour. Uh, reports, two hours, $400, $200 an hour. And I broke it all down, every single thing I did. And I found out that clinically working with patients produced about 1500 an hour. But me going out and doing presentations to audiences and engaging them and coming in as a practitioner to the, to the practice, I could make 15000 an hour because I was generating five to eight new patients at $3,000 per case average. So it was valuable to me to get out there and speak more so than actually being clinical, sitting in a cubicle, which was the opposite of what I anticipated because I thought being a doctor was the most productive thing, but it wasn't the actual clinical. So I went through and I identified every item and I put down the dollar value to it, everything down. I found I was doing some things I wasn't charging for at all. I wasn't making anything off it. And some things I was charging very well for. And then I reprioritized it according to what produced the most per hour down to least and restructured the priorities accordingly based on productivity per hour. And that was eye-opening because I was very clearly indicative of that I was majoring in minors and minoring in majors. Mm. And it was very clear and it was not hard to prove. And it was no, you know, I, I couldn't dodge it. It was face, facing the truth about it. After I did that and reprioritized it, I kind of looked at what was really going to be productive and what not. And speaking was the number one productive. Clinically working with a client in a cubicle was the second most productive. And engaging in reports of, of communications of findings and consultations was the third. Everything else was way lower. Then I, on the third column, I wrote down how much meaning does it have on a one to 10 scale. Each of those same items put on extremely meaningful versus low meaning. Things that inspired me and things that disparred me. Because sometimes speaking to 2,000 kids in high school, it didn't produce the most income, but it was extremely meaningful. And they were producing later patients. So I, I did by meaning, and then I reprioritized that. And then I looked at what was most meaningful and most productive, and I put the, another prioritization between those two. Then I put the next column, which how much is it, would it cost per hour to pay for somebody competently to do the same standard, the same outcome? And I, I did that to the best of my ability. And that was every cost, not salaries, but space, parking, fringe benefits, insurance, every cost down to the computer use, the, the space utilization, you name it, training processes, everything. What would it cost to have somebody do that same activity to the same degree, the same standard, where people wouldn't have a bias? And then what I did is I looked for spreads between what produced per hour versus what it would cost per hour. And then I reprioritized it according to spread. The net column was how much time I was actually doing on the average. I took a three month period to look at what I averaged per day, per week, of what I was actually doing with these hourly activities, these, these activities. And then I looked at that, what I was really doing with my time. So now I'm, I'm looking at what's meaningful, what's productive, what I could be delegating. And then the final column, sixth column, is final prioritization factoring all those variables. And then I layer that final prioritization into 10 layers. And then I immediately put each layer into a job description and I hired somebody to do those things and relinquished those 
And it took me anywhere from one to five people to get me that one person I could release it. I was not the best hire at the time. <laughs> and then I finally got one layer at a time in there. And over an 18 month period, I uh, was no longer doing anything but the top three things that produced the most, that inspired me the most, that gave me the biggest spreads. And my business was tenfold. And I had five doctors that I was training to do the clinical. And I only worked with the most influential, the, the patients. And I had everybody else doing everything else where I didn't even have to be there. And I was out going out and generating in presentations. Well, because my practice grew so fast, and because it was now one of the fastest and biggest practices in Houston, it went from a small little place to over 5,000 square foot with doctors and stuff going on. In 18 months, that noticed there was a convention going on on how to be effective clinician. And they asked me to come and speak. And it was like 5,000 people. Well, that opened up doorways to speak. And so during the 80s, from 82 to about 90, I probably clinically uh, consulted and uh, helped over a thousand doctors grow their practices across America mm -hmm. and into Canada. That spread eventually in the early nineties into Europe and started doing it in many countries in Europe. We created these mastermind training programs for doctors to do it. But what was happening is the same information was applicable to almost any business and new businesses were coming on. So it spread to different health professionals and then into different businesses. And that grew into, um, many different business from then all of a sudden Shell Oil Company asked me to speak and Arco okay. asked me to speak and Yellow Pages in those days asked me to speak and yeah. IBM asked me to speak and I started getting these opportunities and meeting these people that were influential in, in the business world because it was still applicable. And then that, that eventually grew into thousand, uh, thousand, first thousand doctors off, now it's thousand uh, businesses around the world that we've gotten to do. So large businesses, some are billions of billions dollars and some are small and some at the level at the executive level some management level all different levels i've gotten to play in and um and i've just incorporated as i've gone along as i've learned and read many books and also applied it and clinically worked with people um gathered information that's helped businesses grow their business and entrepreneurs but mainly entrepreneurs they're my favorite because i don't want to work with somebody that doesn't have the freedom to go and create what they want mm. I don't want somebody that's working for somebody else living deontologically when they can be living ontologically and mm -hmm. living by design, not by duty. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So uh, there's quite a number of years there. You would have seen quite a few similar, well, I mean, not similar, but moments in time where there was a crash of sorts, where there was a recession or a... I've seen event. four. Four, I've okay. Seen four. So you know what they're like, you know, the before, the during, and the after. Uh, as we're recording this, we're going through an event of that kind with uh, COVID-19. Um, can you take us back maybe to your recollection of any of the previous events like this? Um, obviously, in your own life, you were in different phases as well. So you probably have a different viewpoint as you grew older and had more experience. But can you maybe look at I don't, whatever you think is the most pertinent one for, for now, uh, whether it was the 80s or you know so on, and, and what you took away from that and maybe how to apply it today? Yeah, I'm glad you asked that. I'm, I'm going to back up and address something first so, so sure. I can make context. Right about the time I got the time trap, a guy came into my office who's a financial planner that worked in a company called Associates in Financial Planning. The founder had built the International Association of Financial Planning uh, curriculum and responsibility guidelines for the country. So he's a very sharp guy. Comes into the office and he, um, he wants me to, he wants to ask me if I intend to be financially independent. And I had a bit of a fantasy in those days. Yeah, I'd love to be financially independent. Didn't know exactly what it meant. Sounded cool. Hmm. Wasn't really business savvy. When was uh, this? What, do you, what, what era? This is uh, 1982. Okay. Now, he asked me 10 questions. And I'm absolutely certain that these 10 questions are pertinent. So if anybody wants to write these down, they can write them. Because those <laughs> six, would you agree those six columns are worth listening to? Oh, for sure. Oh, very, very. All right. Now, these... These 10 questions uh, transformed my fantasy and grounded me into reality and, and gave me the pathway to become financially independent. I'm very, very financially independent today because of it. So um, he asked me what my assets were. And I had no idea. I didn't know what the word really meant. And he explained it and I said, uh, I'd have to get it together. 
And they said, what are my liabilities? And I, I have to get it together. Because you were running the chiropractic practice at the time? Or? Yeah, I had the yeah. practice. And I also had uh, loans and expanded my office and got a house and a car and I had okay. debts. And, you know, I didn't know. I, I learned a lot since then. But um, he made me identify what my assets were. Because if you don't have structure and order around your finances, money goes away from you to others who do. Money circulates through the economy from those who value at least to those who value at most, and from those who have the least order around it to those that have the most structure and order to it. And those that have the most emotional, immediate gratifying needs to the most long-term visual strategies. Those that do that are the ones who have money. So I, I got clear about what my assets were. I figured them out, put them together, I knew exactly what that was. I got clear about my liabilities, I got exactly what that was. And then I added or took the assets minus liabilities and I found out my net worth and I knew exactly what it was. If you don't know exactly where you are, you don't know exactly where you want to go and you don't have a strategy getting there, you're not going to get there. That, is that one, two, and three? No, the one, one was assets, one was uh -huh. liabilities. Number three was total net worth. Okay. What I'm those just are, saying is the principle. Those aren't the three questions of the first 10, is it? Or, or those? First three of the first 10. Okay. Yeah. Now, if you go and get an Uber and you don't know where you are, you don't know where you're going, there's no, there's no ride. So I got clear about my assets, clear about my liabilities, clear about my net worth, my, my current net worth, which was negative at the time. Was that a surprise? Uh, no, because I just got a bunch of loans okay. and uh, there's a lot of cost. It, it makes sense, okay. <laughs> yeah. Now, this is the age I was in. Now, once I got that, I then asked the question, what do I want to live on per year passively? Because financial independence is not some nebulous, vague thing. It's a very specific number that you select that you work towards. And then you keep building in momentum, building it further. So I wrote down that number. And that was the next question he asked. Fourth question. The fifth question was, what is the average interest rate you can earn passively from the investment knowledge you have? So that means if you put it into a money market account, it gives you a 3% or something. If you go to stocks, it may be 7%. If you put it in real estate and this, you might get capital gains and you get rental properties, you might get 8% or something. What is your knowledge? What is the interest rate you can earn from your knowledge and in investments? Mm -hmm. And at the time I put 8% because that's about what was going in the eighties. Okay. Then he said, well, now what's the inflation rate? And it was high inflation rate, but I took an average and, um, and then he said, now, what is the total net worth that you need at that interest rate minus that inflation rate to give you that exact amount per year passively? And I had to calculate that. He made me accountable. And then I realized in order to do that, let's say if I wanted to live on 100000 a year, because in those days that was something, six-digit figure. Today it wouldn't be, but then it was. Uh, I would need $2 million earning 8% minus... 3% to average 5%. 5% into 100% is 20. 20 times 100,000 would be 2 million. I needed $2 million right there on the spot that day in order to be able to live financially independent at $100,000 a year. I then looked at the shortfall from where I was compared to what it was, which was 2 million plus, <laughs> And I realized I need that in the next 24 hours. And I thought, okay, I could, if I divide that in half, I got two days to do it. If I divide in four, I got four days to do it. Divide by eight, I got eight days to do it. And I had to keep stretching it because I couldn't see a way. I couldn't come up with a strategy and get me that kind of money. So I gave myself 15 years and divided it out. But then I realized I needed $22,000 a month in savings and investments in order to give you that as an average. Mm. And I was saving at the time $200 a month. Mm. And that was over 15 years as a plan. Yeah. So okay. I had to do 15 years averaging 20,000. So I just sat there and I got uh, jaw tightness, uh, stomach knot, uh, headache, thinking, wow, this is now making me grounded in reality. This is what it actually takes. This is no fantasy world. This is what it's going to take. Mm. How old were you then? In, uh, not to 27. 20, 27. 27 okay. going on 28. Okay. So now I'm, this is... Um, I sat there and I couldn't, I hardly slept that night. I was trying to think, okay, this is, do I seriously want to do financial independence or is this a fantasy that I'm just holding on to like most people? Because mm -hmm. only 1% make it to financial independence around the world. Mm -hmm. So I said, no, 
And I thought, I thought about it and I meditated on it and I came up with what is called a force accelerated savings technique and a force accelerated investment technique. And I realized I'll start at 200. Then three months later, after I get the habit of that, I'll do it 300. And then two, three months later, I'll make it 500. Three months later, I'll make it 750. And three months later, I'll make it 1,000. And then I'll increase it 10% every quarter. And then I, I was saving 2,000, then four, then eight, then 16, then 32, then 64. And I did 128 and $256,000 a month over the next 10 years. Wow. So what I did is I kept increasing it, which is one of the smartest things I ever did financially because it forced my business to be more efficient. It, 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 it stabilized the business with last, lots of cushion money. I learned that from Buffett and, and almost anybody that's got any big company. The Fortune 100 companies always have at least five to six months to a year's worth of capital sitting in reserve. I learned to keep lots of capital, capital in reserve for crashes Mm. And that's when I started, for, started taking advantage of the crashes. So I've been able to catch, this is the fourth crash that I've made gold mines on. I just did really well in the last two weeks. Okay. And before we talk about that, because I am curious about that, how were you able to put away so much more in savings? Was there, was that just a shift in how you spent money or was there or, or both? I, get I, raised, I never raised my saving. I never raised my lifestyle unless I raised my savings and taxes equal amounts. I kept a check on it. So did that mean increasing your business for revenue needed to do that? And is that? Yes. Okay. So, so what I did is every quarter, I went back and I did that same exercise from Alec McKinsey. What else can I delegate? Okay. And then I kept forcing the savings. If I could get everybody who's listening to this to force their savings and put it into investments, I am absolutely guarantee you, I've got thousands of students <laughs> that I've proven this on. It will be one of the best things you ever did. Okay, I do. People, it, keep, people, people keep waiting for extra money to right, save before they save. Yeah, it's okay. not going to happen. Entropy will automatically have unexpected bills and wipe things out because the universe is waiting for you to value yourself. Right. And until you do, don't expect the world to. And every time you do, when you manage money wisely, you get more money to manage. And the more you do it, the more comes to you to do it because money f flows from where it's disorganized to organized, and where it's least valued to where it's valued. And when you're waiting to see what happens you're coming in from uncertainty instead of just proving what's happening by making it and have foresight foresight builds wealth the executive center builds wealth and hindsight destroys it yeah i can i can see the shift there and hopefully that's come through to the audience as well i actually uh, lived through a, a similar process with a business of mine where i you know i looked at the tasks that were low level for me low value for me and then started to build a team to provide that for my company. But I remember while I was doing that, there was this real sense of sort of friction with, I've got to hire this person that eats a chunk of money to pay them. Then I have to compensate with, you know, me doing the higher value work, but there has to be the work to do. Um, you know, for the people listening, if they run a business and that's their kind of thinking, I, yeah, I can hire people, but I can't, like I have to earn more to hire more, to earn more, to hire more, can you know? I, can I address that? Sure. Okay. It never costs money to delegate properly. I want everybody to hear that about 10 times. It does not cost money to delegate properly. It costs a fortune to not delegate properly. To delegate properly, there's a number of variables though. You have to have a preset set of objectives that you know produce more than the cost that you're gonna delegate. So if with that same amount of hours that you just freed up, you're going to produce more and you have to have that clear in your mind and you have to be something that's engaging and inspiring and meaningful to you to do. That's why I did that exercise. Right. If you're not accountable to do that, then your delegation could potentially cost you. Mm -hmm. But then when you hire somebody to do it, you don't just hire randomly. You make sure that what's highest on their set of values is to do that job and they're inspired to it and they have a history of that and they're more competent than you are. So you're hiring up to A people, not down to Z people. Mm. And they're capable of doing it more effectively than you. So you don't have to ever micromanage them and distract yourself. They just go get the job done. Mm. So I can do what I do. I only do four things. Research, write, travel, teach. That's it. Everything else has been delegated. So I can do what I love doing, which is inspiring to me that I don't need to be reminded to do. I don't have to do it. I love doing that. And it produces the most income. And it easily pays for the other delegation. And if they do it and they do it effectively, I've already proven by the math that I've extracted surplus labor value out of, the, out of the spread where I'm actually free to make more money and actually have more time to put to produce the things that produce money. Right. So if it's done really scientifically, it's not a cost. Right. 
So it's, it's, a, it's a cost when you don't know what you're doing. Right. So you just the, hire some random person to try to do something that hasn't been clearly defined and you're not doing your job. Okay. And then the sequence would be being very clear on how you can personally spend the time to produce income before you do the delegation. Because if you don't have that clarity, there's no point looking for an A player. But then it's not, you're not delegating properly. You're right. delegating ad hoc instead of with foreplan. Okay. So uh, when you actually pre-plan exactly, you know what, you already have proven that when I do this, there's more business. Right. And when you're doing something you're inspired to do and can't wait to go to work and do that, that's when the business comes to you. The, the inspiration and enthusiasm is part of what drives the business up with momentum. Right. And if you're doing something you can't wait to do, people can't wait to be around you. And they're there, you know, if you're on fire with enthusiasm, they kind of want to watch around and watch what's going on with the fire, you know? Mm. So you're inspired by what you do. You draw and magnetize people to you and more deals because you now have the time to focus on the deal making. Now, I have a lot of people who are like uh, you, John, in the sense that they're, they're knowledge uh, educators, teachers, trainers, coaches that are listening to this. Um, for their sake and my own curiosity, you mentioned the four things you do today. I think that's probably the four things that most of them would love to do every day as well. What does the rest of your team look like in terms of your delegation? What are they doing for you right now? In summary, you know, what, what do they do? It, it varies. I've got them in different countries. Depends on what they do. Uh, and some of it, frankly, I don't, I don't, it's not even my thing. It's so delegated down that there's people taking care of all that. Right. So I couldn't even tell you some of the things, right, right, some of this, right. the social media stuff, some of the technology stuff. I don't know. I, I, I don't even know someone. They're in different countries or somebody managing them. I don't even know all that. I just do what I do. Research, write, travel, teach. Okay. So, because I found out that if I'm having to micromanage them and I have to pulse them, that I've got the, the I've got the wrong person in there. They're not. They're they're if they're creative and love what they do, they just take care of it and do a greater job than what I could be doing. Mm -hmm. And they just get it done. Mm -hmm. I think I learned that from Buffett. You know, Buffett doesn't sit down and micromanage everybody. He's he's got the people that have already. They don't have to go to work. They're doing it because they love doing that and they're excellent at it. And you you you. I, I've developed a thing that I've used in many companies on value determinations and value applications where you actually identify what a person's life really shows as their highest values and you make sure that they can see how the job description you're delegating to them matches their values so they're inspired to do it. Mm -hmm. If they're not engaged, it's because they can't see how that job duty is going to help them fulfill what's most meaningful to them. Mm -hmm. So I know how to determine what's meaningful to them. I know how to determine the degree of congruency and fluency of that. And I can narrow that down like a science okay. and I can incorporate that into companies. Companies hire me to and hire my teams to do that. So I'm absolutely certain that is doable and it's way more advanced than what the shits that's out there. Excuse the expression. There's a bunch of crap out there. It's hokey pokey little psychometric stuff that doesn't really tell you what that individual values are of that individual and how that job duty specifically is going to be related to that individual value system. I'm specific. Okay. So I don't want to mumbo jumbo stuff out there. I, don't, I want a really a specific question, a specific action, and a specific response to see if they're going to be engaged. And I can do that. I can discern that today. So that helps me discern and hire the person to put the person in there to get the job done. And if a person does that, an individual does that, they liberate themselves from the bondage of anything. Because anytime we do things that are low on our values, we devalue ourselves mm. and we devalue our company. Engagement and having people engaged to higher levels is one of the most significant things to grow the company. People that are uninspired by what they do are costing company. Mm. So you wanna make sure that they're fully engaged as highest engagement as possible so you're free to go close the deals. You know, I think uh, Bill Gates does a great question every day that I think every entrepreneur is wise to ask. What is the highest priority thing I can do? Or Gary Keller says, what's that one thing that I can do that inspires me most that makes the biggest difference that serves the greatest number of people um, in the most effective and efficient way with the resource I have today. Mm -hmm. If I ask that question, that's, that's accessing Ricardo's law of competitive advantage. And that gives me the greatest advantage. And if I can get that and train that into my ripple effect into the company, I can make a, an impact that way. Mm -hmm. But I, I find that if I'm just doing what I do best, the rest of it, somehow the universe brings me all kinds of opportunities. I don't, you, you know what I'm talking about. When you're really inspired and on fire with what you're doing, it's, telephones light up, people call, emails come in, things start happening. Mm. It's, a, it's, a, 
It's a law of attraction I almost. The law of attraction, you know. <laughs> yeah. and, I, and I'm a firm believer that. I've been using that, watching that for many, many years. I know that whatever I study, I attract opportunities on. When I, when I go and study uh, change management, I got contacted from the government from Iran, and they came in and asked me to do change management. I was doing and summarizing the best information I was getting on that. And I immediately got opportunities around the country, in Singapore, and Tehran, and Japan, and uh, Sri Lanka, to come and do programs on that, because I'm focused on that. And I'm mm. drawing that in. So, yeah, your innermost dominant thought becomes your outermost tangible reality, and your innermost dominant thought's an expression of what you value most. And if you keep congruent with what you value most and fill your day with high-priority actions that inspire you, your day doesn't fill up with low-priority distractions that don't. Great summary. Um, let's bring it back to that other question. So I, I think you've kind of connected the dots for me here. You learned about your assets, your liabilities. You actually put some savings away. You delegated to A players. So you had both the financial freedom and the time freedom and, and the stability, the savings. So when these crises occur, like we're going through now. They're not crisis. They're not crisis. So tell me more. You said you, t you took advantage of them instead. How do you see okay. them? Okay, I don't see crisis. I, I think that's that, that whole mentality is an addiction to positive thinking, which is childish. It's an amygdala response sold to the masses and people fall into the, the trap of it. There is no such thing as a one-sided event. Never has been. When the stock market goes up, you're paying high dollar for the, sh for the shares, right? And you're buying things overpriced. So is it a good thing or a good and bad thing? It's good and bad, depending on what context you put it in. If a stock market goes down, you're now getting to buy stock at a, de a dirt cheap price, but it looks like you've gone backwards on the previous purchases. Mm. But actually you're buying now cheap. So there's, it's good and bad. So there's neither good nor bad in any of them to somebody who understands objectively what's going on. So if, the, if there's a crisis, so-called crisis, it's because people only see the downsides and they don't see the upsides. I mean, if we made a list, right now I've got a list of 1,700 benefits that have come in since Corona. 1,700 benefits that have come in the world. The people only, they're focusing on the crisis and not looking at the upsides too. But right now the market dropped 30% something. Great. So the people that have quality cash reserves take advantage of cash for the crash. And as a result of it, they make more than the dip in the business. It makes no difference. Mm. There's absolutely no, no impact by it, except they now get to go back and revamp, prioritize their actions, clean out the dead weight, trim the fat, get more focused, care about the client, get in contact, learn more to the technology. I mean, the pollution's dropped. There's new niches. The people who are adaptable and living by high values are adaptable to new niches. They now capture the niches. They're more efficient online. The, the list goes on and on on all the blessings out of it to balance out the so-called crisis. So people that have a balanced objective viewpoint don't see positive or negative. They always see both. That's what an objective is. A fantasy is seeing a positive without a negative, a, a, a crisis or a nightmare is seeing a negative without a positive. And people that are in amygdala that are running from predator and seeking prey in their amygdala are always thinking in terms of one-sidedness and they're polarized and they're unstable because anything you infatuate with or resent or manically or panic about occupies space and time to mind and run you extrinsically instead of actually being governed from within with a clear vision. You're living by external you know, defaults instead of by design. And people that are inspired by what they do have foresight and they already know to mitigate those and have the cash reserves and to, to manage it wisely so they can take advantage of the, the volatilities that people are normally reacted to. Mm -hmm. so an individual is in a company right now, they're going to learn how important that is. Bill Gates keeps uh, a year's worth of liquid capital in his company, Microsoft. Buffett had $128 billion in cash a week and a half ago. I mean, the people I know in the Fortune 100 companies all have no less than 40% of their gross income every year sitting in reserve. And some of them 50, 60, up to 100% reserve. They know to make sure that there's no emotional outside thing that could perturb their focus and their mission. So people think, oh, I got to get rich quick. And they want to quickly gamble and speculations in the market instead of actually having building scientifically, objectively, a methodical build, wealth building process. And if you study the London School of Economics, there's, there's a science of doing that. It's not a quick get rich scheme overnight by people that are, you know, sp spookers playing games with people. It's a very scientific thing that you can do and apply it and build and build wealth with it. 
Fantastic, uh, John. I know we've, we've only got a few more minutes here to wrap up. So I'd love to just kind of maybe end with the, the final question then. If um, the person listening to this, they are very likely an entrepreneur or, or working towards uh, some kind of business. Um, you said a lot in, in this interview, going all the way back to what your father taught you to the, the, the six, you know, the, the six columns and, you know, how to prioritize uh, to the 10 questions, figuring out your financial situation. For someone who's maybe feeling perhaps overwhelmed by all these different things, especially if they don't have savings right now, so they're feeling like they're getting a bit of FOMO, missing out on all the, the cheap stocks and so on, how would you recommend they think and act in particular now so they're not in this situation come the next opportunity? Realize that every single thing that goes on in their life is on the way, not in the way. It's on the way. And everything that you're not doing wisely, you're going to get kicked in the butt until you do. You can either learn through foresight, learning through mentorship and guidance, or you can learn by hindsight. Hindsight's much more costly. So the first thing I would do is to sit down and write down the blessings and the benefits that are going on in your life right now so you cannot be distracted by the social and the media sensationalistic delusions for the masses and get focused on the objective benefits of what you can be doing so you're focused. Realize that a business starts with serving people. So you need to be really clear. Who is your target market? Who are you going to go and serve? And what exactly do they need? Now, go and contact your clients and find out their needs. Because if you care about human beings, I spoke at a church one time and they asked me, uh, they were talking about prosperity, really kind of esoteric stuff. And I said, listen, I said, if you're poor, it's because you don't care about humanity. If you care about humanity, you'd find out what people want and you'd go and find a way of directly or indirectly serving those needs and delivering it. If you got this talent, deliver it yourself. If not, find some, it does it and cut a brokerage deal out of it, but go and serve people. But if you're sitting there bitching about how you don't have money, instead of going out and serving people, then you're looking at the problem, not the solution. The solution is always serving people. There's no limit on money if you serve people. So care enough to find out what humanity is needing right now that overlaps your niche of inspiration and drive and talent or context of talent, and let's go and find a way of serving the people who's need. Because right now, there are needs. And there's, there's, I've not seen one moment in history that didn't have needs. They're moving, but the person that has the most broadened aspect to get those needs can provide needs no matter what the environment. So find out what your customer is needing, because right now they're needing these questions solved. And go find those needs and don't deliver them and become the greatest at what you do, the greatest at what you do. Be the, the, the most knowledgeable, the most skilled, the most proficient, the most efficient, the most effective person. And I assure you, if you do that and you become great at that, and it's not just a, I want to get a rich, quick, quick rich, but just you really care about becoming great at what you do and broaden your knowledge about the area where people go, this is the person that's got an integral skill and they're, they're worthy of investing in. You won't have a problem building your business. And you got to care and keep at the cutting edge or keeping at the forefront of doing that, serving people, and then take that portion of it and ask, how can I do it more effectively and efficiently tomorrow and keep doing that? And then take it and start a savings. Don't wait to see if you got extra money to do it. Don't pay, your hierarchy of values dictate your financial debts. If you have a higher value on consumables that depreciate in value instead of buying assets, don't ever expect to get ahead financially. It's never gonna happen. You have to have a long-term deferred um, gratification and pay yourself and reduce your taxes by long-term capital gains and grow it and let it work for you. So you're going to work, not because you have to, because you love to. Going to work because you love to is what financial independence is about. It's not because you want to go and lay on the beach and become de debaucherous and go blow your mind with drugs, sex, and rock and roll. It's because you are doing something you love to do because you want to get, you've already doing it. You don't have to do it. You love doing it. That's the way you want to live your life. Always money without meaning, it leads to, um, you know, debauchery, but money with meaning leads to philanthropy. Philanthropy is the thing that opens the heart to be of service to humanity. Okay, John, thank you for your time. Where should we go to find out more about what you're doing or just to, you know, learn more from you? The sim simplest way is just go to my website, drdmartini.com. Drdmartini.com. There's just a plethora of information there. There's YouTube videos. There's thousands of uh, interviews. There's uh, online programs, offline programs, live programs. There's all kinds of things. You can keep an eye where I'm. Uh, there's webinars I do on a regular basis. So yeah. 
Awesome. And you've got a lot of courses I saw there too. I was checking it out. So there's I have 76 courses and I've, I've taught, I don't know how many courses. I've got 76 active courses right now that I do. But over the years, I've taught hundreds and hundreds of programs. Mm, yeah, life, a, lifestyle, a lifetime of teaching. It's very impressive. So keep up the good work, John. That's all I can say. Uh, I love what you say and teach. And uh, it's been a pleasure to, to, to share now with you. No, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you for Thanks, making a difference in entrepreneurial lives.